Hey Grizz fans, welcome back. Today we're doing product management with user experience design. So what do we need to know about user experience design as a product manager? User experience design is crafting digital experiences that delight users and make their lives easier. It brings together research, testing, and design to create intuitive, frictionless interfaces based on how users think and feel. User experience is not just UI. UI is just that visual component of interacting with those screens and apps and sites. And user experience is much more. It's that whole encompassing part of the experience, whether it's part digital, part in person, part of the process and everything that happens. The author Don Norman in the late 80s wrote The Design of Everyday Things, which is a great read, definitely check it out. And Don Norman joined Apple in the 90s and coined the term user experience design. Prior to what we know as the user experience design, there were predecessors like human computer interaction and research in the 70s and 80s. We really saw things change quite a bit. Like in 2004, when Facebook and Gmail launched and we had these snappy applications that were not just static websites, they were truly interactive and engaging in a new way. Google was able to accomplish that with Ajax, a synchronous JavaScript and other technologies where it felt like a desktop application, but running through the clouds and extremely powerful. As we moved on towards the iPhone and then really more so the app stores where they had those containerized software applications that were so much easier to use and based on a touchscreen and the rise of mobile uh, and the responsiveness of having to work with that, whether in an app or, or a page, really shifted the paradigm in the different interactions you would see. And even going beyond that to material design in 2014 and 15 and coming up with standards that are evolving and moving away from what we used to talk about with skeuomorphic design and those other things. We'll get into the details of design later. This is just sort of a lay of the land of where we came from and how we ended up talking about user experience design. The honeycomb of user experience design really breaks it down into usable, useful, findable, valuable, desirable, credible, and accessible. So we'll talk about a lot of these elements, but as a PM, since you are that overarching role that crosses all these different functions, this really helps us advocate or a user or the product to accomplish these different objectives. What makes up user experience design? Three things, information architecture, interaction design, and visual design. Visual design, of course, that's our graphic design elements. There's interaction design, which is about that UI and how different things interact. Information architecture is the structural design of digital environments focused on organizing, labeling, searching, and navigating to help users easily find and manage information. So think about the navigation you would see across a web page, or maybe on the left side of an app with the hamburger menu, those three lines that you see there often. Speaking of information architecture, one of the key elements of that is product hierarchy. Thinking about like Spotify, there's two main hierarchies. You've got navigation and you've got content. So that main navigation is where you mostly interact with it. There's like home, search, you'll see your library, and you'll see other sections like premium. So in the content hierarchy for Spotify, you have the homepage, you have editorial playlists, you have user playlists, artist pages, album pages, and track pages. Within the music content, there are additional hierarchies. Of course, there, you know, there's artists who have albums and then on albums there are tracks at least for now and on playlists you also have tracks so you could have playlists of albums theoretically there's a lot of different ways you could do it but these are kind of the common paradigms we're used to and that's how it works another example is tiktok so the navigation hierarchy for tiktok home feed discover your inbox your profile and the main sections users navigate between in the app home is the top level feed so where you have that, you know, top level feed, is it the homepage or is it another page? So that changed for a lot of companies that changed for Facebook, where the profile page originally was the feed and then it became the news feed feed. <laughs> so for TikTok, your content hierarchy is your user profiles and your video posts. 
there's comments and there are reply comments. So that's another nested layer of the product hierarchy. Then you also have the hashtags and sounds that you can search by as well. On TikTok, so the recommendation hierarchy is obviously key to their success and what everyone loves about the app. That main recommendation content is housed in the Discover section. Discover is on the same navigation level as Home Inbox and Profile. So it's got top billing up there. Within Discover, recommended content is organized into hierarchical levels like accounts, hashtags, sounds, and videos. All right, so product hierarchy, it seems obvious. You got the answer right there. How else would you organize it? Well, you do have a choice in how you do this. Well, I've had actual clients too, where we had to think through creating a social media video platform and how to structure what's a you know channel versus what's a topic and where they work out in that hierarchy so that way we can encourage the things we want the user to do so you know the discoverability is really important All right one thing you can do to figure out what the key hierarchies are for your app is to ask yourself a set of questions so like what are the main components of the app of course you know how are they organized and prioritized like is there kind of a parent child relationship between them how does the user navigate through the different levels of the app what are the primary, secondary, and, you know, kind of extra tertiary uh, actions that they would do. There are other things you can ask too, like, you know, permissions and access control. Are there different types of users? Sitemaps, what are you gonna include on an e-commerce sitemap? You've got global navigation and core site sections, descriptions, categories, and product taxonomies. Super exciting, I know, but how, how do all those things break down? Interaction design is designing how users interact with the interfaces, obviously. You're looking at interface patterns and consistencies, uh, the micro interactions and animations, and wireframes and prototypes. So the design deliverables you'll hear talked about the most are going from low fidelity design to mockups to prototypes and high fidelity designs. And they all have different benefits and may or may not apply on different projects and products that you have, depending on the size of your team, uh, the speed at which you need to launch things. So it depends on all the resources you have, what you would like to do. Wireframes are the bare bones, no nonsense precursor to your design where custom colors and fancy fonts have no room, no place, out of here. Why? Because everyone always has a problem with the color, everyone always has some reaction to a typeface or something else on the screen. So this is a placeholder. Ideally, it's, you know, grayscale with some X's instead of images because it'll just cause a big curve fluffle or something like that. Why do we do it that way? Because we want to stay focused on making the experience awesome for users is a tool to let us have all those conversations with stakeholders to figure out how do we want to craft what we will see on the screen and the different paths for the users and get closer to a design that solves for those needs. Design artifacts, also called deliverables. We've got the high and low. So we have high fidelity design, design that's fully detailed out. It's pretty close to the final implementation of what we're gonna see in functionality and aesthetics. It's got a realistic view of what the product's gonna actually be. And it is suitable for collecting user feedback from users or in focus groups. Low fidelity designs are like oversimplified representation of the design. So we're just trying to get a feel for the function and structure and user flows rather than aesthetic. So it might have like a little bit there, but it's just very lo-fi. We're gonna create those quickly and get moving so we can modify it and explore ideas and get early feedback before we invest a lot of time, effort, and money in building out the whole thing. What is the difference between a mock-up and a prototype? So mock-ups are generally static design representations that you can showcase the visual design of the product with layout, color, typography, imagery, and that will give them something to react to as far as visual design feedback from the user and stakeholders. Prototypes, real talk, real situations, a few of them, awesome. That shows us what we can demo at the end of a project and get a real feel for the quality of the design and what it's going to look like in production for real users. It takes a lot of effort currently in tools like Figma where you have a spaghetti of different connections between all the elements. 
for that to happen. So a few screens, awesome. If you're fully doing all of these clickable prototypes right now, it's still, you may as well just actually code it. I'm not sure what we're actually doing in, in solving for the full breadth of every possible interaction. Uh, that will change as it becomes more automated with the tools that we'll explore. But make your designers not hate you so much by limiting the scope to the clickable prototype that'll help you get your stakeholders and clients what they need as far as demonstrating the capabilities of the product and what the developers need to know to build it. User flows are visual representations or a diagram that illustrates that path taken by users through a product, such as a website or app, of course, to complete a specific task or interaction. So the various steps and decisions users make along the way from entry all the way to the goal. So we really need to map out all those different user flows in order to make sure uh, all those use cases are accounted for and that someone's not trapped in sort of a process hell, which can happen. I don't know if you've ever been on a phone tree for customer service and that happens where you end up in some kind of a loop. You wanna make sure that all your users are taken care of and their path is on the way to accomplishing that task and completing that goal. Happy path. That is the ideal scenario in a user flow where users face no obstacles, magically, smoothly achieving their goal. So that's the most straightforward one that we want to account for in our designs and build towards. Obviously, there are many different things that can happen, many different issues, many different uh, edge cases. And also, we want to at least make sure the happy path is taken care of. And in the happy path, there's no obstacles or errors encountered, and they can successfully achieve their desired outcome. All right, we're talking about design, so we're gonna start with the general design and brand guidelines. So brand guidelines are a set of standards that define that brand's identity, how it's represented across various mediums, including digital. So you'll see in brand guidelines, logo usage, color palettes, typography, voice and tone. There's a great example on that from MailChimp. It's one of my favorites on their content style guide, and they talk about walking in their customer's shoes and they know marketing technology is a minefield of confusing terminology. So they like to speak compassionately like the voice they wish they had. So they are very hopeful and they use offbeat humor and conversational voice. And that guide for the tone in the product will be infused throughout the product. How much personality and what type of tone fits the context because you know, if Chase Bank puts a little dinosaur up there and I can't log into my account to see payday, I'm not gonna be too happy. So you wanna make sure that the tone is consistent for the context that you're using it. Design guidelines are a set of recommendations and best practices that provide guidance on how to design user interfaces effectively. They focus on enhancing usability and overall user experience by ensuring the UI is intuitive, accessible, consistent. They cover a wide range of design principles and standards from layout, navigation, to color, typography and interactive design. Design guidelines have four components. So that's the usability principles to ensure it's user-friendly. You have interaction design, which has recommendations for the interactive elements. Accessibility guidelines, so you make sure it's inclusive for all users. And visual design principles, so guidance on color, typography, and imagery. Design systems are a comprehensive set of tools, libraries, components, and standards used to drive the design process in a consistent and cohesive manner across an organization. And that comes from reusable UI components, code libraries, and already established design solutions that enable teams to design and build efficiently. So in a design system, you have a component library. So that's that collection of reusable UI elements. You have design tokens, which are variables for design properties like colors, fonts, and spacing. You have patterns and templates. Documentation also is super key. I know that's always the boring part, but the happiest clients have been the ones where we have amazing people on my team that do really, really good documentation, which stands the test of time, and they can refer back to for even years to come. Currently, Figma is the standard for design and collaboration. That was a swift change over the last few years from tools like Sketch and Adobe XD and others. 
the ability to collaborate real time in the cloud with speed and accuracy and the ability to share with clients and comment and do so with a tool that is very full featured was a winner. So props to them for the explosion in value that they created. Figma is good as a product manager to know so that way you can be in the designs, exploring the different user flows that are there, uh, commenting on the different pieces of the design and following along with what your team is delivering. All right, visual design typefaces. So only use Papyrus or Comic Sans. Done. Sorry, no Helvetica. Hope you see the movie though. Very good movie. Also, one of the funniest skits ever on SNL is Papyrus. If you haven't seen that. I don't even think this is literally Papyrus. Maybe that was a starting point, but they clearly modified this. But whatever they did, it wasn't enough! For real though, web-friendly fonts are something to think about as a product manager. This is an important way to make sure your viewers in digital spaces can see everything clearly and crisply and uh, rendered as words. Design testing and accessibility, obviously an increasing area of importance as we spend a lot of time and effort to make sure our apps and websites are usable for our users. And there's a number of things we can do to make sure that happens. There are uh, audits for accessibility that we can do. You can check color contrast with a number of online tools. Uh, there are accessibility evaluation tools as well, like Wave, so we can identify potential issues such as uh, missing alt text and other things like that that we can work on and make sure that they're addressed before we go live. So through the last few years, one of the most interesting things that would come up as front page news, as documentaries and so much more, is the hooked nature of how we are with products like social media platforms and their applications. And a lot of that comes through a lot of the work we've done as product managers to get our users hooked on the product. And there are pros and cons to that, and there are ethical dilemmas. But the idea of getting someone drawn into that product and hooked so you have a habit to come back can be a good thing. It could be hooked on coming back to Duolingo so the owl doesn't become sad. And in that regard, you learn it language more and you're able to connect with people across the world. And it can also be a little bit of an ethical dilemma when you are spending hours and not really connecting as much with people and maybe feeling worse. So the idea of using user psychology to create that experience is not necessarily wrong. It's just how do you apply that and balance that with the other goals that you have for your users? All right, dark patterns. They are UX design tricks that companies use to manipulate you into taking actions that you don't really want to take. So you're probably familiar with a lot of these out there and they have names for them like bait and switch. So, you know, offer something attractive and then they switch it to something less desirable once you're committed already in. There's like that fake urgency. I don't know, I actually was at a company once and we found a fake urgency email that a competitor was sending out with sort of a ticking time clock down and it was just a JavaScript code that had a fake counter in there. So there was no urgency other than that made up uh, number that it was counting down from. So that is not cool. You will see that on a lot of e-commerce sites where you're like, oh, this deal only lasts another four hours. And you come back the next day and you're like, oh, the deal is still there. This is a good one. Disguised ads. Companies design ads sometimes to look like regular content so you are tricked into clicking on them. Not cool. Definitely have that a lot. One example here, you've got a add to cart, but it adds to cart with insurance, but they don't really call out that it's insurance except for a little tiny print and that's the default. And who would get insurance on a shoe? I mean, you do need sometimes to re resell a really nice shoe, but probably most people aren't going to do that. And that's a little bit uh, aggressive to try to push that on an average person. Another dark pattern is the Roach Motel. So it's super easy to sign up, very hard to quit. So if you're in a motel, it's a dark and stormy night, so, you know, very easy. You're like, hey, take the keys, go. You're checked in, but it's the middle of the night. It's like hard to check out and they're not gonna give you a refund. So not cool. 
and that also happens with products sometimes. So it is good to keep in mind, you know, what's good for the perception of the brand, what's good for the long-term customer relationship. Let's be a little bit more advocating for the user's best interests and in the long run, that'll help the company as well. Some of those are a little bit of a downer. So we wanna end on a good note and it's not just about making your product or service look pretty with design. User experience is making it easy to use, make it enjoyable so people can actually get things done and when people love using your stuff, businesses succeed. To bring us back from the dark side, the quote from Padme Amidala, Star Wars, Revenge of the Sith. Anakin, I know you're still in there. You're not a bad person. You've just been led astray. Please come back to the light side. Thank you, Gris fans.